So in this lecture, I want to wrap up Kantianism. So I'm going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is to talk about the formula of humanity. The second thing I'm going to do is to talk about just the general advantages and disadvantages of Kant's theory. So let's start with the formula of humanity. Remember I said last time that Kant's formula of universal law is pretty good at giving us moral rules. It tells us don't steal, don't lie, help others, and it gives us the rules in a pretty clear way. We can not only get these rules, we can use the formula of universal law to generate other moral rules. Now, where the formula of universal law doesn't do as well is in explaining why the rules are important. So I think the formula of humanity does a better job here. The formula of humanity will give us a pretty good explanation as to why the rules are important. Okay, so what's the formula of humanity? Well, before we can understand what the formula of humanity is, we ought to ask ourselves what makes human beings special. We think that we're different from animals. You know, I like my dog, I like cats, but I think human beings are more important than animals. I think we deserve respect in a way that they don't. So how are we special? How are we different from animals? Well, Kant says there are two things that make us special. We act for reasons and we can evaluate our reasons. We can choose what reasons are good ones. We can choose what reasons we act on. Well, what does this mean? Well, to see what this means, let me tell you a story about Mr. Whiskers, the, the cat that me and my roommates had that I talked about a few lectures ago. Now, Mr. Whiskers, was a terrible, stubborn little beast. And he loved to scratch my roommate Steven's couch. Just, just one of his favorite things in the world, just go after this couch, start scratching it. So Mr. Whiskers would keep doing this. We got kind of sick of it, so we buy a squirt bottle. And when Mr. Whiskers would start scratching the couch, we'd shoot him with the squirt bottle. And of course our hope here was negative conditioning, right? Kitty will know that he gets shot with a squirt bottle. Kitty will stop doing this. Like I said, Mr. Whiskers is a terrible, stubborn little beast, so he didn't stop doing it. Instead, what would happen is Mr. Whiskers would sit there and you could just see kind of a little war going on in his tiny little cat head. You know, the desire to scratch the couch was kind of warring, fighting it out with the desire not to get shot in the face with a squirt bottle. Now, of course, scratch the couch would always win. He'd go at it, we'd shoot him in the face with a squirt bottle, and the whole thing would start over. Now, what's my point in telling this story besides the fact I think it's kind of funny? Well, my point in telling this story is when you're facing a choice, when I'm facing a choice, there's a lot more going on in our heads than there is in Mr. Whisker's tiny little cat head. Imagine that you know, I tell my wife not to bring in Reese's cups because I will eat them for breakfast, right? Imagine I'm standing in front of the Reese's cups, it's eight in the morning, and I'm like, should I eat a Reese's cup for breakfast? Well, I can ask myself, I'm like, well, what's my reason for wanting to do this? Well, they're delicious, they taste great, especially with coffee, they're just, just wonderful, that nice contrast, right? Well, so okay, that's my reason for wanting to do this, unlike Mr. Whiskers, who just has this desire to scratch the couch, I have a reason for what I want to do. And I can think about whether that's a good reason. I can say to myself, do you want to be the kind of person who has no self-control, who eats Reese's cups for breakfast, can't fit in any of his clothes and feels queasy for the rest of the day? What does it say about you as a person that you just eat Reese's cups for breakfast, right? Contrast that with Mr. Whiskers. I mean, he's not sitting there in front of the couch going, yeah, I want to scratch the couch, but what does it say about me as a cat if I yield a desire and scratch the couch? Do I want to be the kind of kitty who can't control himself? I mean, of course not. None of that's going on in Mr. Whiskers' tiny little cat head. So that's what makes us different. 
we have reasons for what we do and unlike a cat unlike most animals we actually can evaluate our reasons we can ask ourselves whether they're good reasons and if we don't think they are we don't have to act on them and if we do think they're good reasons if we decide that they are we can choose to act on those reasons well Kant will say every human being every normal adult human being at least has this ability and every normal adult human being if they think about it well they will think they deserve respect they will think that their choices their reasons for actions ought to be respected by others but Kant will say look nothing makes you special every other normal adult thinks of him or herself in the same way they think I can act for reasons I deserve respect well if nothing makes us special and we think we deserve respect simply by consistency we ought to admit other human beings deserve respect so this gets us the formula of humanity and the formula of humanity says respect rational beings as ends in themselves never treat them as mere means now Kant often talks about humanity but really this is a shorthand for rational beings beings that act for reasons and can evaluate can choose their reasons Kant talks about humanity because so far as we know so far as he knew definitely we're the only beings that can do this now, now we might have some arguments these days about whether dolphins or you know apes or some really advanced other animals can do this who knows it's not so clear but at the very least most animals can't do this but if we discover intelligent aliens or we create intelligent life ourselves, you know like mr data on star trek I know a lot of you guys don't know who Mr. Data is that makes me sad I used to feel just like a huge geek talking about Star Trek now I feel old but anyway Mr. Data is this intelligent Android if things like intelligent Androids intelligent robots existed we shouldn't treat them as mere means either what's important is rationality okay so you're probably asking yourselves okay that's fine what does it mean to treat someone as a mere means well you treat someone as a mere means when you fail to respect their ability to act for reasons and to choose which reasons they think are good ones you try to in a way get around their ability to reason you use force or deception to try to get them to do what you want to do or in the readings example you don't even do that you don't even ask this guy hey do you want to help me stop this train you just shove him in front of it right well, let's let's look at another example to get a better idea how this works let's go back to one of the examples we looked at before so let's go back to this lying promise example so what are you doing in this example I told a person hey give me some money I'll pay you back in a month well look that's not really the reason I have my reason is I want you to give me this money so I never have to pay you back I don't give my friend my real reason so he never has the chance to evaluate whether he thinks that's a good reason I mean the reason I don't give him my actual reason is because I think he'll evaluate it and reject it so I lie to him I try to manipulate him I'm treating his ability to reason as sort of an obstacle that I need to get around that's what I do by lying to him when someone you know twists your arm or tries to use force they're doing the same thing if someone holds a gun to your head and says your money or your life they're trying to get around your ability to reason they're treating it as an obstacle and they get around it by using force they use fear they think you won't reject that reason they're not saying hey it'd be really nice if you gave me your wallet what do you think do you like that reason or not right precisely by using force they're trying to get around your ability to act for reasons and evaluate reasons I do the same thing if I lie to a friend to get his money 
Okay, so hopefully you guys can understand the formula of humanity. You know, think about our other cases, right? Think about the case of killing someone and cutting up his organs. Well, of course, you're using this person as a mere means. You're using him as a mere means to a good end. But for Kant, it doesn't matter if you're using him as a mere means to a good end. All that matters is you're using him as a mere means. Your end, saving four lives on balance, well, that's perfectly good. But you can't use this poor guy as a mere means even to a good end. You know, the same goes for, again, our trolley example, trying to save lives, but you can't use the person as a mere means. Think about my framing an innocent person example, right? You're using him as a mere means to make society happier, whatever, when you frame him. Okay, so hopefully you guys can understand how the formula of humanity works. But the question then is, well, Kant's given us these two principles, formula of universal law, which I'm abbreviating here as FUL, and the formula of humanity, which I'm abbreviating here as FH. You'll often see them abbreviated these ways. How in the world do these two principles relate to each other? These two tests, are they just, you know, are they independent principles or not? And if they're independent principles, then which principle are you supposed to use? Well, actually Kant thinks that they're the same principle, they're the same way of getting, that they're different ways of getting at the same point. Now Kant might not be right about that, but I do think they're really closely related. And I think you can see this if you think about how and why some actions fail the formula of universal law. So imagine that I want to ride the subway without paying. Now in the US you really can't do this. You always have to put your money in and then the turnstile opens up for you or turns around. In Germany and a lot of Europe you get a ticket you can ride without paying you know occasionally they will check these tickets if you don't have it they'll find you a bunch of money but if you know what you're doing you can avoid it now i didn't do this i lived in germany for a while i'm an honest person i didn't ride the subway without paying but trust me you can do it the, the guys who check the tickets they you know they're pretty easy to spot after a while so let's imagine I want to ride the subway in Frankfurt or Berlin or Munich without paying. Well, I ask myself, could everybody do this? And of course, the answer is no. If everybody tried to ride the subway without paying, then the Germans would do what we do. They would make sure that everybody has to pay, right? Or if, no, if they didn't do that, there just wouldn't be a subway. So notice that my action fails the formula universal law. But the fact that my action fails the universal law actually shows something else interesting. It shows that I'm freeloading on all the honest people who do pay what they're supposed to pay for the subway. They're doing their part. I depend on them doing their part to actually keep the subway up and running or to be honest, so they don't check everybody's tickets all the time, and I'm freeloading on them, right? And by freeloading in this way, I'm actually using them as mere means to my ends. So Kant would say, look, the fact that not everybody can do it shows you that you are using, that you are freeloading on the honest people. You're making an exception to yourself. If everybody did it, you couldn't do it. Think about lying too, right? Well, lying fails the formula universal law. Not everybody could successfully lie because if they did, no one would ever believe anyone. And part of it failing the formula universal law, you know, shows one way it fails the formula of humanity. You wouldn't want everybody to lie because you wouldn't want to be lied to. But the other way it fails the formula of universal law also shows another way it fails the formula of humanity. Liars, in a sense, freeload on all the honest people. 
it's not just that they use their victims as a mere means, they actually freeload, they depend on all of us out there who tell the truth. So the liar is using the person he's trying to fool as a mere means, but the formula of universal law also shows that he's using, in a sense, all the honest people in the world as mere means as well. He's freeloading on their honesty to get what he wants. So I hope those examples can show you guys how these two principles relate. Kant thinks it doesn't really matter which principle you use, the formula universal law, the formula of humanity, use whichever one comes naturally in each case. And there are some weird cases where the two tests might give you a different answer, but they're pretty rare and we, and we really won't need to talk about them. For our purposes, we can mostly act as though Kant were right, that the two, the formula universal law form of humanity will give you the same answer, use whichever one works best in the case. Okay, so to sum up, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of Kantianism. So one advantage that it shares with utilitarianism is a common sense starting point. Think about the formula universal law, sorry, excuse me, the formula of humanity. You think you deserve respect because of your ability to act for reasons. You ought to admit the same goes for everybody else. Formula universal law, if you think about it, a lot of our moral reasoning already goes in this way. Of course, I'm sure you didn't get out of kindergarten without hearing, how would you like it if everybody did that, right? It also brings us to the next point. We often do think in these terms, right? Your elementary school teacher wouldn't throw that at you if it wasn't a natural way of thinking about moral problems. So three and four, are two advantages Kantianism has over utilitarianism. And the first of these is it does really well with fairness. In fact, it's baked into Kantianism that fairness is a fundamental value, that fairness is super important. Think about why, right? Anything that's unfair is going to fail the formula of universal law. Think about my student who wants a higher grade. Well, imagine that everybody, every single teacher changed a grade when a student was a big enough pain in the neck. Well, grades wouldn't mean anything, right? In a world where everybody does this, when an employer looks and sees that you graduated college or even that you have straight A's, might mean you're smart, might mean you're hardworking, it might just mean that you're really annoying and really persistent. In that world, grades would be meaningless. So the very fact that my action would, of pushing her grade up would be unfair is what makes it fail. And again, notice with this one, you can also see how it uses the other honest students who do their work as a mere means. Her grade would be meaningless if everybody were as lazy as she is and just tried to get their grades by annoying the teacher. She's freeloading on the honest people. Finally, Kantianism does very well with respect for persons. And this is baked into the very idea of the formula of humanity. If you use a person as a mere means, Kantianism is gonna say those actions are always forbidden. Certain ways people always deserve to be treated one of those ways is you don't use them as, say, an organ bank, right? You don't cut them up for their organs. You don't use them as a conveniently heavy object to stop a train. So there are certain things you never do to another human being. That's just what respect for persons means. That's what the very idea of rights means. It does a lot better in this respect than does utilitarianism. So what are the disadvantages of Kantianism? Well, Kantianism might not be as good as utilitarianism at giving us clear answers. This is not to say that Kantianism is going to be unclear, that it does nothing. We've already seen that it rules some things out. But whether or not something passes this universal law test might depend on how you describe it. 
So we'll have to think about, well, how would we describe our actions? Or take the formula of humanity, we all agree, hopefully, that we should never use another human being as a mere means. Now, it doesn't mean we can't use another human being as a means. If the other person consents, that's perfectly fine. You know, I use my mailman as a means of delivering my letters. That's fine because he's agreed to take that job. I'm not forcing him to do anything. But Kantianism says we can never use somebody as a mere means. Hopefully we all agree, don't use people as mere means. Well, in some cases, it's really clear whether we're treating someone as a mere means or not. Not treating the mailman as a mere means. I would be treating someone that I kill and cut up for their organs as a mere means. Other cases, though, there's a lot of room for debate about whether an action treats someone as a mere means or not. So holding a gun to someone's head saying your money or your life, that treats someone as a mere means. But what if I'm, what if we're making a deal and I'm trying to drive a hard bargain? You know, I might be selling my house. I know that they desperately want the house and I am trying to put every bit of pressure I can on them to get every dime I can out of them. That might not be nice, but does it use the person as a mere means? I'm not sure. There's room for debate there. So again, Kantianism might not always give us a clear answer, or we might have to do a bit more work at least to get the clear answer out of Kantianism. The second disadvantage to Kantianism is that it might be too inflexible in some cases. And now the weird thing about this is the very things that make Kantianism good in some cases that make it attractive, make it unattractive in others. Well, what do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is the utilitarian will point out when the numbers get big enough, we all start thinking like utilitarians. If I ask you, would you kill one innocent person to save five, your answer would probably be no, hopefully not. But imagine I keep upping the numbers, and I've done this in classes. You say, well, would you murder one innocent person to save 10? Nobody's hands goes up. No hands go up. Would you do it to save 100? By this point, somebody's hand might go up. He'll look like he's a cat getting a bath. He won't like it, but the hand will go up. You keep upping these numbers, and again, people don't like this, but by the time you're done, practically every hand in class will be up. My point here is, Kantianism says there are certain things we should never do to another human being. Use them as a mere means. The utilitarian will point out, if the consequences of not using someone as a mere means are bad enough, we'll all pretty much blink and eventually we'll give in and say we should use this person as a mere means. We won't like it, but eventually most of us will fold. Past a certain number, we start thinking like utilitarians. Kantianism, on the other hand, would say no matter how bad the consequences are, you can't treat the other person as a mere means. The final disadvantage with Kantianism is that it has absolutely nothing to say about non-rational beings. Animals being one great example, right? Now look, we probably, most of us don't think animals deserve the same kind of respect that people do, but we do think that you can't just do anything you want to animals. Kant, on the other hand, since animals aren't rational beings, they don't seem to come into the equation at all. You might also worry what Kantianism is going to say about human beings who aren't rational and will never be rational. People with some sort of severe mental impairment. Well, in those cases, Kantianism is going to have a hard time not saying, well, they're not rational, do whatever you want. Notice utilitarianism might do better in this regard, at least for animals. Utilitarians will say pain and pleasure matter, well, of course, animals, they might not be rational. They can feel pain and pleasure. So all of this is to say Kantianism works well sometimes. Utilitarianism works well in others. 
a lot of what we'll be doing in this class is figuring out which theory works best in which cases. Okay, so that's my quick intro to ethical theory. Next week, we'll actually start discussing some concrete issues.